Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Urbana Community Development Commission. This is our regular monthly meeting, and um, we have an agenda for the meeting. And with that, uh, the meeting is now called to order. Uh, next on our agenda is roll call. Chairperson Fred Cobb. Here. Commissioner Michael Brown. Here. Commissioner Chris Diana. Here. Commissioner Robert Freeman. Here. Commissioner Ann Hines Silvis. Commissioner Karen Hodgen Jones. Here. Commissioner Jerry Moreland. Commissioner Abdul Hakim Salam. Here. And Commissioner James Winston. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is. Um, approval or modification of the minutes. So we'll uh, take a moment and review the minutes, after which I'll uh, entertain a motion for approval or corrections. Is everyone finished with the review? If so, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. <laughs> second. We got a motion and a second to approve the minutes as written. Um, any questions? If not, all. For 17 minutes. Pardon? <laughs> Did we really only meet for 17 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Very efficient. Is that seven? <laughs> Well, that's an aside. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, with that, uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any op opposed, no? Ayes have it, and the minutes are approved as written. Okay, next we have um, petitions and communications, which is any uh, written correspondence, uh, anything? No, no correspondence. Okay. Next, uh, audience participation. Uh, would you like to say something other than uh, what we have in, on our agenda? Okay, well, we'll move on. Uh, next is a staff report. Okay, I will um, point out some highlights for the staff briefing that was sent to you. Uh, we received our monitoring review results um, from HUD regarding our supportive housing program. So we are um, working to um, complete there was only one finding which was really good um, everything else um, there wasn't any concerns about anything else so um, we are working to take care of that um, and um, we also um, resubmitted additional information regarding our annual action plan it was requested by HUD and I believe that they are reviewing annual action plans now so we should be getting our uh, grant agreement hopefully soon um, for CDBG and home um, we assisted uh, the village of Rantoul and submitted their caper to HUD their report and we are working on ours which is due uh, Thursday so we are finishing up on that and we'll be submitting that um, <clears throat> also we're working with the city of Champaign and the community coalition on a subcommittee to um, work on a summit on homeless youth that was a concern that was brought before us and the city um, of Champaign Council so um, <coughs> we are working to be on a subcommittee we're going to be meeting this week to um, talk about um, how that will look this summit will look like and mm -hmm. as we get more information I will certainly pass that on 
um, as well. Um, so, um, like I said, we are working on uh, our response to the monitoring review. Um, I at uh, attended a HUD Homeless Institute conference. It was a one-day training in Springfield. Um, met with other providers, um, communities around the state that also deal with homelessness. Um, let's see. Matt attended um, APA conference and got some valuable, he uh, was able to get it valuable information that will uh, help us with our uh, light reduction and, and other um, strategies. Um, of course, we are um, getting ready for our audit, um, working on um, su supplying information um, for that. Um, and uh, working on setting up uh, new fiscal year activities and uh, drawdowns and then we also show the uh, major meeting the meetings the regularly that we attend so uh, with that if there's any questions about anything just let me know I suppose this is for Matt um, what strategies uh, we learn for the uh, about the um, blight reduction. So that <clears throat> that was um, the American Planning Association Illinois chapter, um, and as part of that conference, there were a couple of sessions that dealt um, with the role that blighted properties can play on, um, I guess, a, a, from a planning perspective and how that plays into the community as a whole, um, and we did spend some time on talking about how community groups could be tapped in to um, turn those into entrepreneurial activities, you know, something along the lines of creating a garden and helping a community group to um, form a, an actual nonprofit corporation and um, use the produce grown at a, a formerly blighted property um, to actually gain revenue and fill in a um, uh, a food desert and that's something that had been done and has and is continually done in smaller communities around the state and we had some people come in and give sessions about those I thought that was very interesting and I think that's something that um, I can use to inform my work here I guess, I guess a follow-up on that yeah with the um, with the black a uh, blight reduction program mm -hmm. Aside from um, Habitat for Humanities, what other organizations are involved in that? So that, the Blight Reduction Program stems <laughs> from a grant that we received in 2015 from the Illinois Housing Development Authority. Um, and to use that grant, it's, uh, we were required to execute a tri-party agreement between the City of Urbana, um, Habitat for Humanity, and then our funding partner, the Illinois Housing Development Authority. So those are the three entities that are involved in that program. Thank you. <clears throat> any, one, any other questions? If not, thank you very much. You're welcome. We move on to our next agenda item. We have no, nothing under old business, under new business. We have two items, a resolution approving and authorizing an Ur Urbana Home Consortium subrecipient agreement, uh, which is Rosecrantz TBRA, fiscal year 2017-18. And then we have a resolution amending housing rehabilitation program operational guidelines as originally authorized by resolution number, well, 2015 dash zero five dash zero twenty three r uh, which is city of urbana housing program manual program uh, years 2015 to 2019 okay we'll st start off with um rosecrans would you like to bring so, us up today yeah and i would like to recognize that julie cartel is here um, from rosecrans champaign urbana um, and she is able to field any questions related to this agreement from the agency perspective. Um, but I do want to start off and also mention that the, the purpose of this resolution is to allow for a new subrecipient agreement with um, Rosecrans Champaign-Urbana 
they've been a, a longtime tenant-based rental assistance partner of ours. We've had three separate agreements with them since 2010, um, as noted in the memo, and it's provided $277,000 roughly um, in TBRA assistance to their clients. So it's, it's really made a big difference in the community, and they've really proven to be a great partner of ours it, with regards to tenant-based rental assistance. Um, so recently they realized that um, the current agreement is starting to run out of funding and Rosecrans uh, made a request for additional funding from the city, from the Urbana Home Consortium um, for an additional $30,000. And um, currently we anticipate that the agreement that they're working off of um, it was signed in 2014. We anticipate that it'll run out of funding next month. Um, so we want to try to, you know, get them at least enough funding for roughly about another year. Um, we want to try to keep it to about a year because um, if we go more than that, we could run into the risk of um, running into some of our expenditure deadlines. Um, and we want HUD to make sure that we're completing our activities quickly um, and being able to have about a year of funding is we felt very appropriate. Um, the proposed agreement would allow them to, would allow Rosecrans to maintain their TBRA program um, and allow that to act as sort of a bridge um, with regards to their clients. Um, clients who are currently in transitional housing or coming out of shelters, this program would allow them to move back into the private rental market but have a bit of a subsidy, subsidy there um, to ensure that they're not housing burdened as, immediately as they come back um, into the private rental market. So the options before the Community Development Commission are to forward the resolution with recommendation for approval, forward the re resolution with recommendation for approval with suggested changes, or recommend that the Urbana City Council not approve the resolution. And in terms of fiscal impacts, um, this agreement would commit um, $30,000 and um, currently the city of Urbana has about $60,000 in, un in uncommitted um, fiscal year 1617 home funds available. That number will go up because we will receive program income um, coming in from paid back mortgages and other sources. And we, as Kelly mentioned, we do anticipate receiving our 1718 allocation as well. Um, committing these funds uh, will help us to meet our commitment deadline, which is currently set as July 31st, 2018. The commitment deadline is currently suspended by HUD, but we want to try to make sure that we're meeting these uh, commitment deadlines just in case things change and they decide to enforce those commitment deadlines again. So we want to make sure that we're keeping up with their regs. Um, and as I mentioned, with regards to programmatic impacts, this would be a fantastic uh, program that would help to um, provide rental assistance and alleviate the housing cost burden that many um, uh, low-income renters experience in our community. And it's very much in line with the 2015-2019 consolidated plan. So st staff recommends um, forwarding the resolution to the Urbana City Council with a recommendation for approval. And I'd, I'd be glad to take any questions and I'm sure Julie would also be able to help out. One question. Excuse my ignorance since my first meeting. The 30,000, it says that you wanted to increase for the city of Urbana, the city of Champaign, and also the county. Is this request being submitted also to the city of Champaign and to the county for funds as well, or just here? The, this request is just coming to the Urbana Home Consortium. And those, the city of Champaign and Champaign County are members of the Urbana Home Consortium, but we're the lead entity in that organization. So we decide um, whether or not um, subrecipient agreements are approved and for what amount. Um, so that's, I, I can understand it's confusing, but. Um, yeah. As long as you told me you're the head, I'm good. Exactly. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Anyone else? I do. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, 
Okay, so I see here that uh, these funds would affect um, owner-occupied whole house re rehabilitation projects. There's one currently in process and there's one underway. Do you anticipate there being a large need for additional um, whole home re rehabilitation that would be diverted or, or put off as a result of the shift in these funds? Because it appears that the benefit is 10, um, 10 households are assisted through transferring this to Rosecrans. So, um, is there an actual increase in need at some point that this would fail to meet, to meet in terms of whole house rehabilitation? Um, that's not something that I believe we're really seeing. Um, you know, we aren't necessarily being bombarded with requests mm -hmm. for um, whole, whole, whole house rehab. Um, this is something that we feel like um, we would be able to redirect funds and it, we wouldn't be neglecting any needs in the community with that regard. I mean, it's it, both are, are fantastic ways to, to use the funds, um, but we do think that uh, it would be appropriate to redirect some of those. This, a whole house rehab does cost about twenty-five to 30000 so it really would be um, assisting one family with a whole house or continuing this TBRA program. I think the um, number of applications that we get has gone down as well. In the past, we would maybe five to seven, six to seven, um, and I think we've only been seeing you know, like maybe one or two people contact us. So um, I think we've had this program for many years, and so I think that we have, have made a, a big impact on um, households um, in the community. So it may not be as much of a need. Um, as maybe it was in the past, but you know, if we did get someone that contacted us, we would certainly look at our new funds because we would, you know, be able still be able to help them. It just would be not with this older money, but with new money. Okay. So just to be sure, I understand um, this program wouldn't be in danger of of. Uh, closing or, or the, the whole house rehabilitation program would carry on. It's just a matter of you would allocate new funds. Yes. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Got a question. Um, I was wondering what uh, brought about the shortfall, the need for the request? Um, it, the previous agreement was allocated for about $32,000, and mm -hmm. as I mentioned, it was signed, I can't remember if it was 2014 or 2015. Um, but it, it stretched for a long time, and um, this is we've just reached the end. Uh, it's been funds have been drawn out of that agreement since that time, and as the expenditures keep coming in, it's we're just reaching the end of, of that agreement. So that's why we've come forward for a new one. Do you happen to have the number of uh, residents or people that have been served under the program? Do you have those numbers? Hi. Um, I don't have over all the years. I did not pull that data. I just have the data right now for what we're serving. It is a number that I can get for you for sure, but I didn't pull it before I came tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The um, purpose of my question also was to find out was there any significant incident or thing uh, that brought about this request? Um, or just no. to gradual usage of funds? Mm -hmm. it, it was gradual usage. Um, we had some accounting reconciliation that we did. We thought we had a little bit more time. Um, we thought we had more funds left in the agreement. We reconciled our books mm -hmm. and realized that we only had one month left. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why this may appear somewhat urgent. Um, but yeah, that's really where this came about. Plus there's, there's still a need for assistance. Mm -hmm. Very much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, just question along the same line. I'm just trying to sort out in the, the math sort of in my mind and see what your future needs may be too. If, based on what I see here, since 2010, the contracts have covered around $280,000. Does that sound right? 277 and change, which would be an expenditure of roughly 40000 a year so to speak. And so we're providing another 30, but we have an agreement that runs through 2020. So it would seem to me like we're 
automatically knowing that we've got some additional shortfalls too. If, if I'm assuming the program is pretty steady mm -hmm. and it'll be a pretty ongoing need, I guess that would be my question to you. Is it a, has it become an expanded need or is this just really more of a steady need and this is additional funding needed to meet that need? I didn't know if you wanted to answer his first part, but yes, it's been a steady need. And um, right now, for example, we're serving eight clients. Um, of those eight, six of them are in the first year of their tentative two years, and two of them are in their two-year lease. And we try and keep the leases and the agreement to two years so we can continue to bring new people in as the funds allow. But there's an ongoing, there's been an ongoing steady need. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I guess the second part of that was what do you see as a, as a future need then between now and when the contract expires in two and a half years, three years? I think it's always kind of an estimate because, I mean, we, we, we could average what um, rent, what we pay for rental, um, and it depends on the income because we, the individuals have some level of income. Of course, less income than the more of the rental assistance, but um, we're currently averaging probably about twenty-five hundred dollars a month that we for these eight individuals, and it doesn't vary too much from that. That's probably a pretty standard average um, that we see each month that we're we're needing assistance with. Okay. Then I guess more back to the city. What is the extended plan then? I mean, is it? assuming we will have additional funds available to continue yeah. to do this? And yeah, that's um, long term. I mean, we're certainly open to continuing um, to field requests from Rosecrans um, as the contracts run out. Um, as I mentioned, we're anticipating this will last about a year, so we'll probably next fall um, come back and you know reevaluate where they're at. Um, and if Rosecrans wants to try to make the case for a larger amount and, and more funding to serve more clients, um, we'd be open to listening to that. Um, you know, it's, it, we're really trying to play it on a year-by-year -year basis at this point. Okay. So these really aren't year-to-year -year contracts. It's just an, just an expanded amount under the overall contract. Is that correct? Um, this is a separate contract from the previous one that is running out of funding. Okay. Um, and we anticipate uh, creating new subrecipient agreements um, as requested by Rosecrans. Okay, so it's the agreement itself that's running through 2020, the subrecipient yes. agreement. Yes, yeah. And uh, like I mentioned, it's based on the funding, we think that it would be a year, but we have that three year gap just in case. You know, something happens, they need to suspend the TBRA program for a year and pick it up again. Um, we have that flexibility built in there. HUD provides, I think, four years as a project completion deadline. So we want to try to give us also, um, you know, flexibility if at the end of three years, we're obviously not anticipating this will happen, but if at the end of three years we have to pull back the funds, we still have a year where we can put them to a different project mm -hmm. um, and make sure that HUD doesn't pull them back. Okay. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what happens at, at Roseacre when a person comes to Roseacre? I mean, you know. what happens when someone comes to yeah. Rosecrans? Was your question? You, you so for this for this program, um, we will provide the case management services and um, to help people so that they can move into independent, complete independent living financially. So. We are a mental health and substance abuse treatment program, which we know impacts often people's ability to live successfully, independently, and be able to pay, pay their rent. So we link them to those services as well, or any other barriers that might be playing um, in their lives that making it difficult for them to live completely independently, financially. And how does a person get involved in Rose Acre? Do they get, have to be uh, referred by somebody? Or they Anybody can, the they can simply walk in. Um, we get referrals from teachers and doctors and, and anyone in town, um, but also we have the opportunity people can just walk in and request some assistance. All age groups or is it? Yeah, we start as young as five um, for mental health services and then all the way through the lifespan. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Just one quick question. Sure. 
in your, um, thank you for the question, because that was the question I was asking. So you have the contract overall, and then you come for funding each fiscal year for what you might need. Am I correct? Until 2020, with right. some flexibility for HUD. Am I, am I getting yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, of the percentage of money, where is your overhead? How much overhead percentage are you guys receiving from this? Or is there overhead for administrative costs or fees? I, I could not answer that right off. If our executive director was here, she okay. could. <laughs> that I could not answer for you. If you could get that to I me, can I get would that. appreciate it. I sure will. Okay. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have our usual options to uh, make a motion to approve the, uh, f for a resolution approving and authorizing uh, the home consortium subrecipient agreement with the um, re with a recommendation for approval to the city council council, or we can uh, recommend with uh, suggested changes or we cannot recommend approval. So uh, with that, uh, I'll entertain a motion. I move that resolution approving the agreement with the approving and authorizing the Urbana Home Consortium Subrecipient Agreement Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve this recommendation to the City Council. Uh, any questions, comments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Okay, next on our agenda, resolution amending housing rehabilitation program operational guidelines as originally authorized by resolution number 2015-05-023R, uh, City of Urbana Housing Program Manual Program, years 2015 to 2019. With explanation. <laughs> um, so the, just want to take a step back here and talk a little bit about the purpose of the Housing Program Manual. Um, it primarily governs our use of community development block grant funds, CDBG funds, and HUD gives us very wide flexibility in how we use those funds. Um, we can use them for uh, many kinds of public services, um, rehabilitation programs, but they encourage us to create a manual that helps us to specify the income groups that we're targeting areas of the community that we're targeting and that's the purpose of the housing program manual um, you know it, it sort of specifies what we're using these funds for and who is who and what is being targeted um, as activities by these funds so the activities would be the emergency grants access grants senior repair in the whole house as well as property acquisition all of the all of our uh, programs, activities that are related to housing specifically. And I'll let you keep on. And the proposed amendment here would be creating another program um, that would, it, it stems originally from a, um, a monitoring visit that we received from HUD in May. They noted that when we use CDBG funds to tear down abandoned and blighted uh, single family homes, um, in the city, specifically with regards to the blight reduction program that I mentioned earlier, um, they noted that we count that as um, benefiting affordable housing because in almost every case we donate the land to Habitat for Humanity, who also in many cases um, develops that property with an affordable unit, um, home ownership unit. So in that way, we're able to then complete Mark the, pro mark the project as complete in HUD's eye as soon as the property is then sold to an income eligible buyer. And that process can take a little while. It can take a couple of years. And that's what HUD noted um, during our monitoring visit that 
because of the length of time, they wanted us to instead, when we take down a vacant and blighted structure, to mark that as slum and blight reduction. And if at some point later on, we transfer that property to Habitat and they build a house on it, then we can go back and change that into affordable housing. Um, but for the moment, they wanted to specify that as slum and blight reduction. So that's where this new program comes in. And, and part of the reason also is that um, HUD no longer, they discourage holding on to properties for a, a long length of time. They want to, you know, within just a few years or less. So that is another reason why um, they noted that in the monitoring. So just moving into the, um, the text of the proposed amendment, um, the two main criteria for a property to qualify for it, um, the property needs to have blight or physical decay um, that's not in a slum or blight area. We don't technically have um, any designated slum or blight areas in the city of Urbana. So really it is a, a citywide program at this point. Um, and the activity must be limited to either clearance alone, such as through a, a court-ordered demolition um, or acquisition by the city and clearance thereafter. 11.8.1 um, .1 talks about um, the acquisition and 11.8.2 uh, talks about clearance and I particularly want to draw attention um, to points 3 and 4 under 11.8.2. Um, under uh, section 3 there, um, we actually received guidance from uh, the city's legal division today um, that encouraged us to, to steer away from um, reaching an agreement with property owners for demolition based on case law and other, um, other criteria. Um, so we're actually recommending um, under section 3 there, the text says that Clearance activities not involving acquisition can only be undertaken once the legal authority to proceed has been obtained from the owner of the property. We would like to strike from the owner of the property there and just once legal authority has been obtained. And that could be if the city owns the property, that would be, you know, we would have legal authority. If we had a court order, that would be legal authority. So basically we're just broadening our scope there. Um, in section four, or yeah, the fourth paragraph there is just talking about um, if we received a court order on a property, demolished it, we would put a lien on the property for the cost of the demolition. Um, as with the previous uh, resolution, the options before the CDC are to forward the resolution with recommendation for approval, forward the resolution with recommendation for approval with suggested changes, which is staff's current recommendation, or do not recommend the city council approve the resolution. In terms of fiscal impacts, this is really just a, a program modification. There's no fiscal impact to this decision. However, by broadening our programs, it could, could help us to um, expend money more quickly, CDBG money, um, and that is something that HUD tests us on annually. They wanna make sure that we are meeting our timeliness test, so that could help us out there. And um, programmatically, you know, this could help us to it could remove a barrier that we had that we see um, between allowing the city to um, remove vacant and blighted structures in the community um, and help us to at the same time stay within <coughs> HUD's guidance um, in meeting uh, HUD's recommendation for us. So, as I mentioned, um, staff's recommendation is to forward the resolution with suggested changes with a recommendation for approval, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sure, I have a question. Uh, I mean, it certainly seems quite uh, logical that this proposal should be enacted because it's HUD's recommendations. We don't want to somehow jeopardize uh, possible funding and other things based on a, a tiny thing. But I do have a question about, uh, about selling this to a community or neighborhood in which the structure is located. The message of clearing a property in order to produce affordable housing is a very positive one. It's growth focused. It's something that a lot of community members would seem likely to support. The idea of saying that someone's house 
um, you know, perhaps someone who's living there is a blighted property and is going to be torn down and may in the future possibly be used for affordable housing. Even if it's exactly the same process, it sounds more difficult to sell to a community. And I'm wondering if you've given any thought to that small change in messaging and how that might affect the city's work in the future. Uh, absolutely. I mean, anytime you're using the word slum and blight, I mean, that that's not that's not the message that we want to be sending. And really, we want to try to steer um, in the direction of redeveloping for affordable housing. And that's, we included in the amendment that a lien placed on the property would be, um, you know, we would consider forgiving it if it's, um, if the property is donated to a housing developer or um, another nonprofit. You know, that's, we're really trying to push in that direction. And by no means do we want to send the message of, you know, suggesting that any area in the city is slum or blight, but this is a spot basis. And sometimes on a spot basis that does happen. And we want to be able to get rid of blighted structures when they appear. And these are also words that are from the regulations as well, so. Okay. Um, couple of questions um, I, I, on that uh, 1182 number three yeah I, I, if you weren't going to do that I would have suggested that because it really it kind of opens a Pandora's box of all kinds of things that you could end up doing that you don't want to get involved in um, my question would be what what you see as potentially a financial impact in that with regard to blighted properties, as we all know, or anybody who's been on the commission for a while, any time that subject comes up, there are a wide variety of people who will be happy to supply you with a long list of properties they all think should be torn down almost immediately. So there's no shortage of potential candidates for a program like that. In the past, we've really had that link to affordable housing, things going to Habitat, etc. If instead we are, in a sense, warehousing blighted properties that have been torn down with nothing but a lien as an IOU, it'll have an impact on finances and budget. Where do you see that kind of going? I mean, do you anticipate that there's actually going to be a lot more funds tied up in properties that have been demolished or acquired and demolished but have not been turned into? Well, I, I wanted to note that um, with our blight reduction program, mm -hmm. we worked with building safety um, and came up with the list through the different um, lists that they have of vacant um, and such properties. So, um, so that was where we got that list um, mm -hmm. for that grant. Um, so it was specific. Um, targeted in certain parts of the city. So um, it's possible that we would continue to work with building safety on um, different properties because they, they keep different lists, uh, vacant and, and other um, lists. So I'm assuming that we would continue to work with them. Matt may also have something else as well. Yeah, I just wanted to note that um, the paragraph right above 11.8.1 um, specifies that um, we're, the city is required to expend 70% of our funding on low mod benefit activities. Mm -hmm. And slum and blight reduction is not a low mod benefit activity. So at most, we can only spend 30% of our, our funds on this. We don't anticipate even getting close to that. Okay. Um, you know, this is something that when it comes up, we want to have a tool available um, to meet the need but we are required um, to spend 70% of our funding for infrastructure in low-income areas, housing rehab, things of that nature. And that, that comes from HUD. We have no choice in that. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, obviously these are the stories that uh, there are a few of those that float around that are kind of mm -hmm. moderate horror stories, but they're from bigger communities with, with much more blight to deal with than we have here, but where the city is the cities involved have virtually put themselves in financial straits by becoming the biggest owner of vacant property that you could imagine to a point 
that would speak to the same thing Commissioner Braun was talking about, where they end up having to just start selling property in order to generate enough revenue to keep going on the on the program, and the affordable housing element sort of disappears. Follow up to Commissioner Diana's comments. Um, so in um, 11.8.2, um, Section 4, the last line says lien may be forgiven or waived by the grants management division if the property is transferred to or owned by a nonprofit housing developer or a CHDO. Um, how are those funds then reabsorbed? Because there are real costs associated with demolition, and so that is an outlay of funds. And so how is it, at least accounting-wise, um, that the city doesn't wind up just expending and not recouping those funds? So that if it's if the property is then developed with affordable housing, it then meets a national objective of um, CDBG, and that's it wouldn't require repayment or anything, and it would be, you know, we wouldn't get that fund repaid. Mm -hmm. But because these are grant funds, it would be meeting exactly what the federal government wants us to do with those funds, which is reducing slum and blight and then developing affordable housing. Um, so yes, it's true, you know, we would be forgiving the lien, we wouldn't be getting those demo costs back, but we are using it, using that fund and creating an outlay financially um, to meet the objectives of the program. So fiscally, yeah, it's an unmet, um, unmet debt, but it's it's for the reason that it's supposed to be. In addition, also with with affordable housing, um, the houses that um, Habitat builds um, appraise um, fairly well, and then you've got those property taxes that are coming back into the city. So, even though they're, we're not getting the grant funds back, the city is, in essence, getting money back by by doing this through the property taxes. And Okay, and then just following up on that, um, by not actually acquiring properties in, in advance of um, c conducting demolition, which is what the modification to this is trying to, um, trying to, to allow, um, is there any kind of cost benefit in that, in the city not actually acquiring funds? Or do you kind of get money back out, if whatever you sell, you kind of get, um, if you purchase properties and conduct demolition, do you get the funds back, including demo costs? on those projects? Not directly. Um, usually it's, in the past, our property acquisition demolition disposition program, which this is amending, has been almost used almost exclusively um, in partnership with Habitat or Homestead or a different Chodo um, for eventual redevelopment with, with affordable housing. Um, there's really not an expectation for direct repayment um, <clears throat> Don, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, this uh, community development block grant, when the funds are put out there in meeting a national objective, there generally isn't an expectation um, for repayment. We can offer them as grants to subrecipients or income eligible um, households in the city, and we're not required to um, expect or to put some kind of a lien and get that money back. Um, regulatory from HUD, um, but we can do that if we want. Just a follow up if, uh, for Matt and, and Kelly is that on the other end of this, you get the street credit with HUD for development and housing, even though you do, on the front end you got to put some outlay. On the back end, it really makes our organization look good. And if we got another Chodo involved in it, that would even enhance. Uh, our program here in Urbana. So you recoup it on the other end with street credit. So if you do nothing, then it's, it's almost going to hurt you uh, with HUD because you will come back with more points and saying you got to get these things in order and we're not going to fund you. So I just see it as our job to be able to develop more chodos or more organizations to do more so that we can look better uh, and get more residual dollars for other organizations completely agree and I do want to um, also specify there um, that uh, we do have in our whole house rehabilitation program that is given it as half grant half loan so when whole house programs if when they're sold um, 
we do get twelve thousand five hundred dollars back um but that's the only program we have correct me if i'm wrong um that has a and that's yeah, home under, that's under not home. cdbg mm -hmm. so yeah i know it um in the past um we had different programs and the way they were set up that if they sold we would get payment back as well so we do get program income from um, some of our programs which then can be used for staff or other things thank you very much for your explanations i wanted to understand how that worked and sure. you did a great job explaining thank you okay then just kind of in summary there if we're not if we're going to make that change to 1182 three that doesn't kind of open the door to a lot of other new activity then what i'm seeing here is that basically we're going to be doing pretty much the same thing and we expect really the same results all we're really doing is moving a mile marker from here to here that keeps us in better compliance with hud so we're calling <coughs> a potato a potato and that's about all <laughs> cool. yes. it'll work Okay, got one question. Um, since you take uh, the owner of the property out of there and substitute legal authority, uh, how much prior notice would be given to the property owner that this activity is going to happen? And um, there was another one. Um, oh, as far as a blight, could code violations be considered blight? So in, with regards to the first question, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know exactly, because we haven't done many um, court-ordered demolitions um, since I've worked with the city. I believe uh, the city gives a 30-day notice, and then action is taken at the, at the end of that notice to, um, you know, the, they then go to the circuit court, and the court then has a summons on um, the property owner in the city, um, I believe that's the process, but I would have to research the Illinois demolition law um, where that's held. Um, but there would be notice. Definitely, it wouldn't be that an owner would just suddenly realize, "Oh, my house isn't there." I mean, that would not happen. <laughs> um, and we want to avoid that. Um, yeah. And the code violations. The code violations. That contributes to our building. Kelly had mentioned that we work very closely safety. with our building safety division on yeah. this. Um, and code violations can contribute to um, a property being considered uh, not approved for occupancy or condemned. Um, and that's really the, the marker that we would use to um, define as being blighted. Um, those properties are ones that are um, not approved for occupancy, basically meaning that um, it's a, it's a, a threat to the neighborhood. Kids could access them um, and get hurt in them. It's something that we don't we don't see as being a feasible rehab, so we see it as a, a demo possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible that um, code compliance issues could build into um, a condemnation um, or not approved for occupancy that would then trigger some of these programs. Okay, because code violations cover a broad range of things that, uh, some things that seem not reasonable <laughs> to uh, other things that are dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, well, there's a whole range of things, that's why I asked that. Right. Some people would be willing to live in property with some code violations mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the violation not be uh, an issue, uh, whereas if the city wanted to come in and get the property, they could say it's blighted. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's why I was asking that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not real familiar with all of the different mm -hmm. uh, code violations and what all that means. I mean, yeah. we can certainly get that information if you're interested. We could see if maybe somebody from Building Safety might want to come and they could share about. Mm -hmm. Code enforcement. I mean, we could certainly see about getting information. Would that information. be under the definition of blight? It's. It, I think it's kept deliberately vague by HUD. The definition <laughs> of blight. Um, they want to provide us with flexibility. They don't. 
um, you know, specify the number of code compliance. As far as I'm aware, they don't specify um, anything like that. So we're given pretty wide latitude um, with how we define that. And in the instance that you mentioned where, you know, some people might find it acceptable to, you know, to live in, in a, a situation that, you know, might fall on, might have a number of code violations. Um, if we demolish a property and have to relocate someone, that triggers the Uniform Relocation Act. And that is a very expensive, <laughs> expensive and labor intensive and time consuming process. Mm. Um, and we don't want to displace anyone anyways. And, um, you know, dealing with URA is just yeah. another reason not to. Yeah, I remember going to a training and the first words that the trainer said was, if you um, don't have to do this, don't do it because mm. it's very difficult and expensive and because you have to calculate how much over a five-year period and it's just, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. they had a, a pretty thick regulation. So we have definitely worked to avoid having to do anything to speak with, with that because mm. it is so uh, complicated and expensive. Okay. I believe, Fred, for what it's worth as a general combination of type of violation and time factor on those mm -hmm. that the, the type of code violations have to include uh, inability to occupy the premises so it has to be mm -hmm. the water or sewer or heat mm -hmm. something that precludes that oh, and then it's mm -hmm. uncorrected over a period of time it becomes blighted is the theory behind it mm -hmm. now as Matt mentioned what exactly that period of time is maybe flexible thing <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. okay thank you okay any further explanation if not uh, we have our three options uh, to forward the resolution uh, to City Council with our uh, the approval with our approval to forward the resolution uh, with suggested changes or to not rec uh, forward the uh, resolution. With that, I'll entertain a motion. I move to forward the resolution to the Urbana City Council with the recommended changes um, by staff, striking that bit of language um, about the, from the owner of the property mm -hmm. from Section 11.8.2, um, Section 3. Uh, uh, yeah, forwarding that with suggested changes. <clears throat> Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second to um, forward the resolution with our with the approval of um, of the Community Development Commission. Are there any comments, questions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Ayes have it, and the motion carries. Okay. Um, that exhausts our agenda for the evening. Uh, do any commissioners have anything you'd like to bring up at this time? I, I have just one thing. You, you mentioned that the that reconciling the books with Rosecrans determined that there was actually less money than expected. Is there a way that that could happen uh, earlier than a month before the funds run out, or or uh, some kind of procedure that could be put in place so that that reconciliation process happens more frequently? Yeah, that, I mean that's something that we're we're always working on. You know, putting. Um, Usually it happens when we do draws from the federal government through the integrated disbursement and information system. Um, and sometimes that could be a couple thousand dollars in either direction. Um, so it's, it's, you know, not going to create a huge discrepancy, but like this situation, it just, you know, it caught something that crept up on us. And, you know, we're definitely going to make sure that we're accounting, you know, for working more closely with our subrecipients to make sure that, nothing like this happens again and we do have a lot of procedures and policies and we're forever updating those as well so we'll make sure that we we have you know that this doesn't happen again okay thanks okay anyone else if not this meeting is now adjourned thanks for your participation thank you